those I can calculate. Let's say the mean of that is a point that's over there, for example. So that's x b bar. I can go take several samples from system A. I, they don't need to be the same number. I could be seven or eight samples this time, but I can take them and I might get these values over here. Those might just happen to be the values I get from system B. And I don't think the mean from system B and it's a point over here. Sorry, from system A and B it. So in that case, when we recalculate x b bar minus x a bar, we get a positive quantity. So that data set. So that's for the data set with circles. Now if I repeat this experiment again, I can go ahead and collect several data points from A and B again. So this time I might use these points, or I might obtain these points from my lab. So this my points over there, and this time the mean B is over here. And the points from A might line up over here. So sorry, oh, to steal with so System A's mean is over there. So that's x a bar and x b bar is over here. And if I calculate x b bar minus x a bar, again I get a positive. So I'll repeat this another time, third, fourth, or fifth time. Sometimes I'm going to get a positive difference, sometimes, sometimes I'm going to get a negative difference between the systems of A and B. Now, if we take these, this, the same experiment, but what if my samples come instead from a histogram to histograms that are as follows? So their system. So now I repeat that same idea, take several samples from A, several samples from B, this is just to emphasize the view. And this is view A. Repeat that process several times. Pretty much every time I take samples from system A, the mean from system A is going to be greater than the mean from system B. Okay? Guaranteed most, most times. It will, in fact, be a very rare occurrence where the sample mean from system B will be greater than the value of the sample mean from system A. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, in engineering situations where we make an improvement, and the improvement is this dramatic, you collect your experimental data, you don't have to go ahead and do a t-test or a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. Right? The answer is right there in front of you. Don't need to convince anyone that there's a significant improvement. What we are concerned about in this particular course, and where most real situations are, is where these histograms overlap fairly substantially. Okay, so it might be that it's this case, or it might be that it's this case, and you're trying to understand whether B is better than A. So in this case, the histogram B and A are fairly overlapping. But here's the key, the long-term difference of system A is better than system B. Okay, if our goal is to get more to the right of that horizontal axis. If you do a set of experiments, you can easily find XB bar and XA bar to have different signs. But most of the time you repeat this experiment, XB bar is different from XA bar is going to show you that xb bar minus xa bar most of the time in this data from this system will be negative for most of the cases. In some of the cases you might get a positive. In this example over here with the overlapping histograms where they're pretty much identical systems, 
half the time your XB bar is going to be greater than XA bar, half the time it's going to be other than that. So our purpose then is to essentially construct a confidence interval, not from UA or not from UB. Our goal with this part of the course is to construct a confidence interval for the difference between those two. So UB minus UA. And we'll construct a lower bound for this and an upper bound for that. So we've got to find bounds within which the difference in these lines. Now, people often ask what happens if I choose, if I switch A and B around? Will I get a different result? We'll get a different result, but your interpretation will be the same correct interpretation, provided it works systematically. Okay. So, switching A and B around won't lead to any, any problem. We'll still get the correct interpretation. It's the next thing that we spent a little time on yesterday was actually trying to understand how to decode these answers. And we looked at some situations where these numbers span zero and other cases where they didn't. So we'll, I'll repeat some more examples in today's class with a different case study. You have to get good practice with this interpretation. So given that as a recap of yesterday, let's go back then and just wrap up this last few slides on calculating the test for differences in this example. So the main just preview we have the example before we have a feedback control system that the vendor is offering us to try out. System B. That data then takes 30 days to acquire. System A then is two data points there. That's about uh, three years of data that we've got. System A already. That one month is in system B. So we're trying to make comparison then between the last 10 points of B, sorry, the lowest 10 points of B and the last 10 points of A. And we landed up at this slide. So we skipped over this and we're going to come back to this today. We skipped over those two slides and we ended up with this discussion on slide 84. Um, it made it look a little bit different than yesterday. The only thing I've done is I've unraveled that inequality so it's on one single line. But otherwise, the slides are very important to the one we just have in front of you. And what we have then is essentially notice here in the middle is that, that difference in the means mu b minus mu a. And here's my lower bound term in mu, and there's my upper bound term in mu. And these terms, x b bar minus x a bar, are defined on our raw data. N a and b, we know sigma is the one issue we're faced with. So yesterday, Jenna asked, me, how do you know what sigma is? So what do we use for sigma over there? Well, you've got two options. Sigma is a variance. And you can go use your historical data to estimate the variance. Now, one way you can go do that is go look back at those 300 data points. So this is the slide that's called method 2A. We've got um, an external estimate of sigma. External way to estimate sigma. Do you use any of the 300 samples you have and you go measure the variance of those 300 samples? You get about 6.61. Remember the reason why we can do this. The key reason is quite simple. Go back up here to point number two. It says assume that the standard deviation from histogram A is the same. So it's telling us we don't really care whether we get our data from B or from A. They both come from the same distribution, uh, sorry, they come from the distribution of the variance, the same standard deviation. So one way we can get that value of that standard deviation is to simply use the long-term standard deviation from the raw data, all of it, all 300 data points. So plug that in over there. And A was 10, and B was 10, and now I've got my Now, if you want, you can go through this discussion on calculating the z value and you get a value of 1.03. Some students find that confusing where you calculate the area of minus infinity up to 1.8 or 1.03. I prefer to, to jump over that for now and I may come back to it on Monday's class. But to me, it's not critical to understand it. What is more critical is the alternative way of getting to the 
same answer, and that is through confidence where we now have my XP bar minus SA bar, got that information, I've got sigma from this external estimate, I've got NA and B, my CT value I get, that's the 1.96, and now I'm going to go down minus 2.75, and then up about 8.8. Let's interpret that. What does that tell me? Is system B better than system A? Why are we using the T distribution? Because we're making 
estimate of the variance. Recall previously when we looked at the central limit theorem, if you know what sigma is, or you've got a large enough data set to calculate sigma, you use the t distribution to calculate your lower number. The moment you're using the smaller data set, then you use the t distribution. The t distribution now use, means that your critical values in this lower bound and upper bound, we replace cn by ct. So put ct there instead, and then resolve for the lower bound and upper bound. Okay. And I, I have those values reported. So I don't have the lower bound and upper bound. I think it's later on in some slide. But the, the lower bound and upper bound in this case is a little bit wider. I'm going to talk next class about interpreting the Z value and risk. And then the next time, I just before I do that, I just want this concept to set in a little bit more. So it takes a little while. And next class, I will talk about the Z value and risk and what the area under the distribution means in terms of risk how that's got an equally amount of interpretation. Um, so I'll leave that for next class. And we'll do that in a different example. So let's just, uh, let's just quickly summarize here. If you're using this method to test, you've got two options. Either you know the variance or you don't know the variance. And if you know the variance, you use the normal distribution. If you don't know the variance, you use the t distribution. That's essentially summarizing it there. But my preference is, if you can, and you have a large data set, is to use the raw data themselves. Recall we showed how to derive the box plot last time. The box plot showed us a big wrong in about 1 out of 10 cases. In 1 out of 10 cases, we had an improvement in the yield in the process, just due to the natural variability. Um, with these methods, we'll look at the next class of how So that's a summary of that, that situation. Um, now I'm going to just talk a little bit about this assumption of independence. And to do that, let's go back to the slides that have the grid A and B on it. And just talk about this. This is an important assumption that you make in using that test for the calculation of the law, is the idea of independence. So, we need to explore the idea of independence a little bit more carefully in engineering context. So I've said before in this class that this is an assumption you're likely to violate. Many processes, we need something from them do not have independence. So for example, if you take stock market data, sequential data time, those data are not independent. The value of the stock today is strongly dependent on the value of the stock yesterday. So successive values of that price is not independent. If you go to a reactor and measure the temperature, you measure the temperature now and an hour later and an hour later still, those successive temperature values in time are not independent. The data you looked at, the assignment that you're submitting today, that large data set that came from the distillation column, that flow rate is not independent in time. In fact, if you zoom in on that data, look at maybe 100 points in your window, you'll very, very quickly see that those data are not independent. And there's a strong relationship between the data uh, from one time to the next. So when you do experiments, and your experimental analysis requires independence, all that the central limit theorem says, to be valid, you need independence. You better ensure that you meet that criteria. Okay? And there's no <laughs> test for independence. I can't give you a statistical test like the QQ plot or that test for normal distribution. There is no test for independence. The only test for independence is your thinking through the process. So let's take a few examples. Company here is trying to test a new coating. And that coating is applied to the to a, a base so that coating will repel moisture. Packaging sheet, for example, uh, a good example of this is if you 
go to the grocery store and you buy uh, wrapped turkey, those containers or plastic shrink wrap around the turkey is actually a multi-layer film. So the polymer people will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a multi-layer extrusion of plastics, and one of the layers in there is especially designed to repel moisture. And if you're trying to design this new coating to repel moisture, you could potentially go do the following. Uh, you've got two coatings that you're trying to test. So you've made one formulation, A, and you've got a second formulation, B. You're trying to test which two, which of the two is better. So if you go do the following, you go and take this sheet of paper, let's say this is the sheet, and you're going to go apply the coating to this. You're going to cut this sheet of paper up into 16 pieces. You're going to apply coating B to one half and coating A to another half. So this is the easy way to do it, right? Because you simply take one sheet, fold it in half, apply coating A to one side and coating B to the other, go cut this side up in eight pieces, cut that side up in eight pieces, and give it to your lab technician to measure how much it repels moisture. But what about those eight values of A and eight values of B? Are they really Single sheets of A, 
that single sheet I've chosen might have a different effect. And if it shows a difference now after doing DNA, I might get the wrong analysis. And the analysis might not be due to the coding, it might be due to the sheet that you've applied it to. So what you should be doing is not just taking this data A and B from one sheet. You should actually go to your supplier and take the different sheets apply coatings to this part of the sheet, then go to another batch of material sheets, create it on a different day, a different time by the supplier, and select another sheet to work on that, and so forth. Okay. So we often do this. If you think back to that control example that we just spoke about over the last two days, there's actually a lack of independence right there. Because we're taking those 10 samples of B for that new feedback controller, on 30 successive days, there's a lack of independence there because the raw materials might be the same raw materials that, that time, that operator might be the same operator for all 30 days, whereas in period A it's a different operator than in period B. Okay, so we're seeing the effects of other variables at play and not the actual variable that you're testing. So lack of independence really needs to be thought through carefully. To try and avoid it. We'll talk about this quite frequently in the experimental section of this course, but I'm already starting to try and lead you into that way of thinking before we get there. Another case where this is often used is if you consider um, trials for fertilizer or wheat. So I've done some work in the past with the wheat, um, with wheat growers, and they'll try out different wheat crops in different parts of the field. But if you see A as one part of the field and B as another part of the field, I put all my A crops here and all my B crops there and I can test for difference. It might not be the wheat that's different. So I'm trying a genetic variety of wheat A versus a genetic variety of wheat B. It might actually be the underlying soil and the fertility of the soil that's, that's picking up the difference. So we need to randomize our, our experimental data to guarantee it. So randomly assign blocks of A and B on the sheets. Use sheets from different suppliers. And then you might also think, well, what if I only have one sheet available? One way that we can work with this is then calculate the difference between B and A. So one sheet, calculate B's hydrophobicity, calculate A's hydrophobicity, and calculate the difference that's a paired test, so that's what we're going to look at on Monday. It's a paired test, and the paired test then says that even if there is a defect on the sheet, as long as that defect is across the entire sheet, that defect will cancel out when we subtract A from B. So pairing helps cancel out and creates independence in our data for us. Here's another one. Guarantee you're going to face this. You're trying to test a new raw material. Your new raw material, however, needs to be inserted into your process using a different uh, method. Is it expensive or the new material needs to be changed? So to do that, you need to shut down the process. It takes 15 hours to change over the dispensing system from the existing to the, to the one that's appropriate for material. The supplier of this new material, they give you a freebie of eight batches to test. Each batch is three hours. <coughs> so you can run that over the weekend. If you think this is great, the process isn't running over the weekend. Way. I can come in, do this work, 8 times 3, that's 24 hours, do the plant trials, and get the line back ready for regular production on Monday morning. So you're going to do all your batches for me <coughs> after setting up the process on Friday, and get ready for Saturday, run 24 hours. Right there, you can already see that those Eight, time, eight batches of B that you're running over the weekend are not independent. <coughs> They're not independent because of which reasons? What's not wrong in this experiment if you do this? This is definitely the most convenient way to do it. What's going to go wrong when you do the analysis? Same person 
person running the experiments over the weekend, which is different to the person running the experiments prior to the weekend on the regular weekend. So you've got a different person doing this. So batches are being run one right after the other. So eight sequential batches, so lack of independence between those eight and seven points, absolutely. Anything else that could go wrong? That would cause you, when you do your analysis, to have an answer that is really not a correct number. Let's assume there is actually no difference between E and A. You go do the work in this way. If you go do the analysis, you're going to find that there is a difference between E and A. In other words, what you've ended up doing is you're lying to yourself, but unintentionally, because of your poor experiment and setup. So those eight batches are not independent. There's a different person running experiment B versus the person running experiment A. During the B experiments, your lab is shut down. Okay, so you have to hold those samples aside and wait till Monday morning to go give them to the lab. Maybe that time that those samples sit on the shelf there and degrade causes a, a change in the sample so that when it's analyzed in the lab, you get a different results. Whereas typically during the weekdays, those samples are sent to the lab right away and get processed in the evening. It might even be that simply just changing over to switch from A to B, you cause the modification in the process. <coughs> many, you'll see this guaranteed many times in your career, you're changing a process out, you actually fix up a problem that was always there, unintentionally or you introduce a new problem that never was there before. So simply the changeover might improve or deteriorate the process. So there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. So what should we have done is to randomize those experiments. Now randomizing these experiments in this case is so cost prohibitive. It says run A, then B, then B, then A, then A, then B, in some random order of flip points and figure out B versus A. But if it's taking you 15 hours to change out the process to switch from A to B and then 15 hours from B to A, you're definitely not going to do the randomization. So there are smarter ways of doing it. One way you might do is do uh, runs A to B, and then the next weekend you run B to A. We'll also touch on split point experiments. These are experiments that intentionally recognize that you've got this block of data that you need to run and you can counteract that effect. So then what I, my point of looking at this is to tell you firstly, where possible you must randomize your experimental order. You cannot control for these disturbances. And secondly, if you know these disturbances exist, you can build them into your experimental protocol so that you can counteract them. And never go do experiments just for the sake of doing them. If you've got these problems, you can always counteract them by a smart design. So we'll cover this in more detail later on, but I do want to point out the Okay, let's, uh, let's resume back here this discussion. Um, what happens if our samples are not independent? Okay, so this is um, a topic for 600 level students, and there's a full example in the, in the chapter 2's exercises that, that you can work with this. The key result from this discussion over here, and I won't go through it because it's fairly involved, but it simply says that when you have lack of independence in your data, your confidence interval becomes wider. So your confidence interval will become wider than it otherwise would have been. Or in the case of negatively correlated data, your confidence interval actually becomes narrower. So it, as long as the point is here, as long as you know that you've got lack of independence, you can deal with it. If you simply go ahead and assume that they are independent and they're not, you're going to get the wider confidence into what you might have otherwise. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on that topic. And if you're interested on this, uh, there's a full uh, example that you can work through in R and simulate what happens in the case of lack of independence. What I do want to just end up end off here with are two examples. The first one here is this situation. Just to help you interpret confidence. So consider the following example. You've got two reactors, sorry, I should say two impellers that you can use in your reactor. You can either pick a radial impeller 
or you can pick an axial encoder. Now, they will provide different types of agitation in your reactor, and you can measure the mixing time. There's ways we can do that with the spectrum, spectroscopic methods to measure our mixing times. And what you do is, after mixing, you can measure this confidence interval, health this confidence interval, and there's two cases that you might get. So there's the first example. Your confidence interval goes from minus 450 minutes to 284 minutes. <coughs> Our aim is to get the shortest mixing time, which in the other way. So, 
there's a confidence interval that shows it statistically doesn't matter which one you pick. Now you can start to bring in economics, so it doesn't actually know the cost more or less than a regular impeller. Or is the risk of being picking the actual impeller still worth it, even at double the cost of money? Okay. What in the second case? Will you pick the axial or radial impeller? that there's no difference between the, the points from one method and 